Hello, I'm Marwan. I'm Devin. I'm Phoenix. And welcome to The Wasteland and the Mountain, where we discuss the state of the left, analyze where it's gone awry, and together envision a path forward from the wasteland and towards the mountain. As a disclaimer, we'd like to quickly clarify that the thoughts we share and opinions we espouse are our own and not representative of any organization to which we may belong. Um, it's June 19th. You are listening to episode six of The Wasteland in the Mountain. In our prior episode, we explored the first three parts of Rams and Cannon's article on ultra liberalism, the intro of the article, the sections on liberalism as a consensus U.S. ideology, and the left's fall away from organized labor. Today, we are in section two of our episode series, working through parts four and five of Cannon's article on nonprofit industrial politics and the ultra liberal tendency. Before we get into the nitty gritty with Cannon's article, I want to take a moment to remind listeners about the hopes we have in diving in with this article. The left is talked about by many commentators everywhere in very sweeping, imprecise, and clumsy ways. There are many reasons this is the case, but nevertheless, good faith commentary on the left demands a certain level of understanding and nuance to remain good faith. Bad faith commentary on the left may have its moments in the attention economy online, but will almost certainly never have a serious reach amongst the many on the left, because even those misguided in their best effort labors for the purpose of empowering the working class, developing their political and class consciousness, and for the aims of winning over fellow members of their class into the same fight, even those who fight the good fight will always be able to detect good faith from bad and will demand commentary which illuminates the conundrum of fighting for a brighter future for the working class in the mire of consensus ideological liberalism, which actively seeks to stymie all those efforts. For precisely that purpose, anyone who seeks to commit to this fight needs a strong sense of the landscape. Ultra liberalism is a phenomena that regrettably defines the majority of the left. This is because liberalism is a consensus U.S. ideology as Cannon presciently underlines in his article. Liberalism has many permutations, and this also mean that, means that political fights within the U.S. are between different ways of emphasizing the liberal project. This also means that even those who put forward a good faith effort in their attempt at winning power for working people will often find themselves recreating the ideologically hegemonic politics of their upbringing. No matter how many general strikes are called for on Twitter, no matter how many potholes filled or marginal identity centered, a meaningful break from the consensus ideology of liberalism doesn't appear on the horizon. That is unless we can find a way to compel the good faith leftist wandering the wasteland of consensus liberalism over to a more strident and confident politics of unrepentant class analysis of anti-racism, universalism, solidarity, internationalism, one that forcefully rejects the modalities of ultra liberalism of cancel culture of woke posturing of moralizing concern trolling, of empty rhetorical maximalism and favors a left which is solidaristic, intellectual, daring, forward thinking, relatable, willful, autonomous, and whose compassion for the downtrodden and marginal has a meaningful material component beyond empty rhetorical posturing. In that spirit, we aim to explore Cannon's article further with hopes of clarifying the state of affairs on the left and identifying the hurdles to bound when moving forward. And uh, with all that said, we're going to get into kind of a summary of sorts of Rams and Cannon's article, part four, nonprofit industrial politics. Uh, Devin, whenever you're ready, take it away. Yeah. So in this, uh, this part of part of the article, Cannon illustrates the range of the NGO world, the landscape of the, nonprofit sector, especially as it pertains to civic needs from churches, member orgs, charities, healthcare corporations, insurers, 
community organizing groups, community development organizations, and much more. The major through line across these NGOs are they are entities that crop up in the void of social goods and services that the state could and likely should concern itself chiefly with, i.e., Civic sector nonprofits are a consequence of a negligent civil public order. Canon states, they represent the privatization of the public goods, civil society, and civic participation. Further, uh, Canon asserts that the nature of the NGO industry as the privatized expression of public goods and civic participation means that even seemingly non-political entities are often interwoven with left-leaning politics or liberal left political strata in cities and states, end quote. Cannon speaks about how around any industry, a politics grows up around it to justify, protect, and advance it. This is also exacerbated by the fact that the modern bourgeois state encourages this because of the sheer power dynamics of the state to intervene, regulate, and protect industries, but almost no willingness to arbitrate these dynamics meaningfully. Therefore, it delegates this out to each industry to instruct the state accordingly to lobby it with its so-called expertise. Um, so I just wanted to, to make a comment here. You know, so, so the issue Canon raises with the, the nonprofit industrial complex is that uh, since the left broke ties you know, with the labor movement and is the main locus around which, which the broad left organizes itself around it takes social issues and privatizes them you know making what issues are funded at the whim of of corporate backers or like government funded grants both of which you know do not and will not ever challenge the dominant hegemony so while nonprofits don't generate profits they still employ individuals in a privatized fashion and as employees they have to be of course employable so you know in other words they must make a living Thus, they must toe the party line, so to speak, and, and kowtow to the entities funding these NGOs that that will, you know, only fund NGOs that comport with their private interests, which are, you know, de facto non-revolutionary. And that's that's one of the issues with um, with NGOs is is that just like private for-profit businesses, where like private sector um, dictates to the state. You know, like these private sectors get to pick and choose which causes are revel, um, relevant and which aren't contrary to democracy. Like, like take something like the smartphone, for example. You know, the smartphone uh, completely changed the human race for the worst, for the worst, I should say. Yet, who decided what power the smartphone was going to yield? You know, it certainly wasn't the people. It was a select few um, individuals with, with wealth and, and power and private interests that, that dictated their private interests, uh, to society. Yeah. The, the nonprofit complex is a farce because it creates a band aid. but really what it is, is it plays a janitor. So actually the nonprofit complex is an excellent metric to see all the places in which society falls short and that fails to address itself. So anything that you need a nonprofit for is is kind of a, a marker, an indicator on well, why aren't why hasn't society figured out how to solve this problem? Why why do, why mm. do we have to pick up the pieces? Um, and on top of that, it's uh, it's it's completely a, a virtue signaling farce for the most part. You know, what percentage of uh, the money goes to the actual uh, cause versus being pocketed or being you know re, you know just invested for inner purposes for salaries and so forth we don't necessarily know and a lot of them are, are complete bs um and you know there's a whole culture around it which is very very bourgeois you have these big fundraisers in malibu and in downtown manhattan where people come to be seen, to be glitzed up, to take selfies in, in, in front of the, you know, the beautiful, <laughs> wealthy scenery and to be shown giving their check. Uh, but really, they're doing it for ego. They're doing it, you know, just to virtue signal. Um, but it doesn't solve the problem. It, it, you know, you, you can kill the ants that come out from under the fridge. But unless you, you know, find the source of it, you're just kind of a, attacking the uh, effect and not the cause. Yeah. Yeah, I think... Uh, well said, gentlemen. And another thing to point out um, is that, you know, n- the nonprofit world, um, uh, you know, has been around for a while. But I think, um, in you know, since the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, 
uh, it, it's kind of gotten to be quite hegemonic in some capacity. And I think that has a lot to do with the left's fall away from like labor organization. But I think it also is a result of the way the government is run in the United States and liberalism is like a con consensus ideology. Um, I think the thing is about nonprofits is that they're often responding to needs that exist in society, but for which there is no institution in the state that exists to directly deal with that need. So it's kind of like that need is kind of relegated off to the private sphere, you know, um, and, and through these like NGOs, then they're called nonprofits, but really they don't systematically address the issue. Uh, and, and, it, and it's just constantly in this limbo between flirting with, a, you know, state funded dealing with certain issues and uh, leaving those issues kind of on the table so that the funding can occur next year so people can make their careers out of it. Um, and, and that's just that's just liberalism, you know, um, I think like a, a state that was actually interested in resolving these issues would probably think like, hey, this is, you know, there's always going to be people who fall off and, you know, become like, say, homeless, you know. So why, let's say let's let's imagine ways we can have systematic ways of rehabilitating people who fall into this kind of mire um, and deal with it in a comprehensive and decisive way and give them full wraparound supports and, and, you know, make sure that there's always public housing that they can get into. Like if state were interested in dealing systematically with the issue, I think it would, it would think of things on that level, but if it can relegate it out to the nonprofit kind of industrial complex, then it can give the impression that it's doing something while at the same time making kind of a market out of these needs, you know, yeah. by yeah. relegating it off to the private um, sphere in the nonprofit industrial complex. So it's really right. a, a vicious cycle. And I think it has a lot to do with, with liberalism. It would be an so, excellent juristic to simply uh, uh, go down the list of nonprofits and then convert that into a bullet point agenda of policies that should be taken on by the state. Yeah, that actually, that's a really good idea. Um, you know, if somebody came up with that list, it would be, I would probably not be shocked to see that our, these are, that, that all these nonprofits are in some way representing some need that the state has left just kind of out, you know, uh, for the private sphere to, to take care of. Um, okay. So getting back to the article. Um, so, you know, Cannon talks about this kind of uh, birth of nonprofit industrial politics, but then he kind of narrows in uh, and he talks about the competition to be authentic representatives of the community is of extremely high priority to those engaging in the politics around the NGO sector. The authenticity around which claimants can claim becomes the sine qua non of NGO politics, and therefore the politics of the NGO world uh, uh, defectors becomes a politics of the policing of authenticity. Cannon points to comments by Harvard sociologist Jeremy Levine on this topic that are very prescient. Uh, quote, there will never be a definitive answer to the question of true authentic community representation because there is no such thing as a single cohesive community vo voice, end quote. Further statements of the tensions of political dynamics of policing authenticity, Levine says, quote, as conflicts arise, the discursive tactic of policing community representation is used instead of countering competition claims directly. To be classified as an outgroup member is enough to have one's substantive comments invalidated for not representing the common good, end quote. In other words, there isn't an objective locus from which authenticity can be determined because besides in-group, out-group, social policing and maintaining the graces of peers who are not themselves tethered coherently to a basis from which to meaningfully judge your authenticity, leading to a vicious cycle of insecurity, Cannon goes on to further assert that ultra-liberals recreate this politics in all the places they frequent, unmoored 
from the specific challenges of the organization they find themselves in, which only sharpens and intensifies this modality. Uh, Devin, you had some thoughts here, right? Yeah, so it's 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 here that Cannon, you know, like once laying the groundwork for his his you know Marxist materialist analysis of of the rise of ultra liberalism out of the ashes of the left's break from from the labor movement and its adoption of like the political logic of uh, of NGOs, he begins to to break down like what an ultra liberal is in the abstract. So you know, in other words, like this liberalism that's that's unwittingly adopted the premises of, of NGO logic, like divorced from actual NGO activist work. And this is where we get into this this free floating, like nebulous left as a um, social and cultural force that really has nothing to do with the historical left, you know, the, the haves versus the have nots, the ancient regime versus, versus the people and, and so on. And what we get is, is the left that's all about the policing of personal identity you know, and like this anxious compulsion to virtue signal as being, you know, in, in the moral in group. Um, and we mentioned this in the last episode, but this is one of the, the points that I, I think is one of one of the more profound points that Cannon makes here is just this this tying of this, you know, nebulous free floating left, you know, to the, the, the separation of the left from the labor movement and its adoption of like, you know, NGO logic and how that sort of seeped into just uh, just the general like social policing of you know your today's ultra liberal in general. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. So further, Cannon speaks about this distinction in NGO movement type work that draws a sharp line between staff and constituency. Good work within these organizations are often seen as a blessing or incidental, and social anxiety within these organizations is common. Staff are here, and, quote, the community or the people are over there. This logic pervades the ultra-liberal project as well. Phoenix, you had some uh, yeah, the, yeah the, the challenge for civic sector NGOs, I think, lies in their ability to generate um, or fabricate the appearance of authentic community representation. Um, you know, they navigate complex terrains where individuals and communities have diverse entities um, and interests and social relations. And this constant struggle to maintain legitimacy and monopolize authenticity leads to a politics of uh, policing boundaries and defining political personhood. Um, ultra liberals have a tendency to undermine political agency and question the authenticity of others and uh, impose subjective qualifications for political worth. So they prioritize individual commitment and radical aesthetics over strategic vision and actual collective action. Um, and this tendency creates a toxic culture within mass organizations. It depoliticizes members and demoralizes them and it erodes solidarity. Um, instead of focusing on the working class and forging meaningful connections, um, it becomes a race to the bottom where members fear having their own authenticity questioned and they resort to reckless acts or attacks on fellow comrades. Um, it's not about who's most deserving or morally superior. It's about building a collective understanding of actual shared interests and forging solidarity. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're reading there from uh, Cannon's article. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, did you have any comments that you wanted to make pertaining to that? Yeah. So if, if you've been to um, a meeting uh, with leftists, you might see the tendency for cannibalization based on purity tests. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, oh, you have this one little opinion that's slightly off. So you're anathema. And yeah. it creates this yeah. radicalization of particulars that it's like you, you have to be exactly this, exactly that, according to the dogma. Um, and if you stray slightly, if you have like one slight, a different opinion on social issues, then it doesn't matter that you're in the same class. It doesn't matter that we both are antagonistic to the, uh, you know, to the ruling class. Uh, now we're fractured. And right. the irony is that yeah. that that seems to, you know, in, in the people's minds that are that are doing these purity tests, they think that they're 
so noble and righteous, uh, but they're actually cannibalizing the movement and they're doing the exact opposite of what they set out and intended to do. Yeah. 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 I think totally. it, it, it relates to this kind of NGO mentality of um, constantly like making a pitch for the, the, the authenticity of, of your, your, your ability to be representative of quote unquote, the community, because that's the modality right. in nonprofits that is kind of like latent and perpetual and just kind of imbibed to survive. You have to constantly be ma- like making that uh, case. And, um, you know, from my time in the DSA, I would say that comports completely. Some of the most, the loudest voices were people who were kind of attuned to that game. Right. Yeah. So for example, like when I first joined the DSA in like 2017, the people who were rising to the top were in the nonprofit sphere because this is the logic they were kind of playing at already. You know, they were, they were, they were just attuned to this sort of thing. So continuing on with the summary here in the final section of part four of Cannon's article, he gives more attention to the notion of the chronic insecurity of movement jobs asserting that movements and organizations which do not defer to the existing status quo of civic sector NGO organizations represent a significant and tangible problem for not only those civic sector uh, NGO organizations, but especially the individuals or leaders who run or are associated with them. This is because the organized complex of NGOs depends so stridently on their perceived community legitimacy. And organizations who don't tow this NGO logic effectively threaten this legitimacy. Like, for example, like a working class organization of socialists like the DSA, right? They're not there to prop up, like the DSA is not there to prop up anybody, any like NGO community leaders legitimacy, but community leader like NGO types who join the DSA can't, can't break from that mire that they're in to just as a quick aside so further that the individuals in those leadership layers and those adjacent to them are operating in a state of constant insecurity as they maintain their position as a function of their ability to influence and effectively manage social movements yes i mean this was so prescient i've seen this precise dynamic like i've said in my experience um and uh there's really kind of a lot to say here, but, but nevertheless, this is totally apt. You know, I'll have to, I'll just have to leave it there. Um, Devin, do you want to take the next part? Yeah. So we're going, moving on to part five, the ultra liberal tendency. In part five, Cannon begins to describe and delineate the characteristics and contradictions of the ultra liberal in greater detail, illustrating the contradiction of how they relate to power, stating, Uh, And I quote, the contradiction which ultra liberals contend with is that they understand instinctively that they cannot keep formal power, the cause of oppression, out of the hands of others if they do not themselves monopolize soft power, end quote. So the soft power is power in its implicit forms, you know, social capital, clout, well-being um, regarded or well enough regarded anyways. Cannon connects this tension with how liberals, and I quote, require people to meet some rubric of moral political worth to count as political actors, end quote. Further asserting that ultra liberals use this as a discursive weapon to attack the authenticity, bona fides, and merit of others, either one by one or in whole groups at a time. That they concentrate power to wield this discursive weapon with themselves and for fear of losing this political personhood themselves, terrorize others to maintain their qualification. Yeah. Yeah. This is, uh, that's true. I, and again, I've seen that kind of play out in, in uh, various left orgs, um, you know, which I've, I've, I've belonged in, participated in. So and I just want to mention here, this, I just oh, want to ahead. Mention- that one more thing that that attitude is very anti-meritocratic because it designates the authority to dictate from above uh, what the culture should be to those with the most brash attitude and it's often very narcissistic types 
You know, it's like, who are you to say that, uh, you know, you're the arbiter of what's morally pure or not, because that's your opinion. And now everybody has to follow your every minuscule aspect of your opinion to a T or else they're reactionary in your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, if we define merit as something that's like tangible uh, and not kind of abstract, but the, the, you know, like Canon will talk about later in this article, this concept of the uh, ultra liberal meritocracy. Um, in fact, did he No, Yeah. We haven't got to that part yet, but um, uh, yeah. In the, in the, in this ultra liberal meritocracy, and he gets at it here in this previous paragraph, like these, these NGO kind of quote unquote leaders are they that are themselves like the best arbiters of, of people's authenticity, you know, but authenticity is a very like, that's a very moving, you know, that's it's not a nebulous extreme, concept, extremely nebulous, you know? And so, so it's in that sense, it's very anti meritocratic, right? Because merit, you know, it, it really depends on how we define it, but like any sort of functional tangible merit is the kind of merit that people use to get jobs. You know what I mean? Like, and people get yeah, like objective and, qualifications, yeah, objective qualifications among other things. And that's not to say that people don't get jobs in dubious ways. Of course they do, you know, but, but what I am saying is that there are certainly tangible and functional and objective ways to assess merit. And ideally, you know, in a just society though, that would be, centered as much as possible over just absolute nonsense and abstractions, you know, um, moving on to the next part of the article, uh, within section five, um, is called the ultra pipeline. So the ultra pipeline Canon goes on to speak about the dynamic of the ultra pipeline, which is the notion that liberals undergoing radicalization, do so along a liberal spectrum, never really wandering away from a fundamental liberalism, regardless of their rhetorical or ideological beliefs or personal aesthetic. As background, starting with the 2008 economic crash and Occupy Wall Street, Cannon points to the extreme lack of a strong U.S. socialist tradition or widely representative working class socialist organizations to help engender a strong sense of how politics ought to be. Cannon asserts that this concept of the ultra pipeline is akin to a hopping over of serious mass action socialist politics. Ultra liberals often smugly assert this kind of politics is to their right as they skip over this and into various strains of ultra left political orientations, anarchism, sectarian Trotskyism, Maoism, and often styled in tedious and very online manners. Cannon asserts that this is merely people taking a step from mainstream liberalism to ultra liberalism, but furnishing and adorning themselves with the aesthetic of more radical traditions. Cannon states, quote, at any given moment, these ultra liberals will champion very radical or maximalist demands and express frustration with serious discussion of the steps to get there as somehow undercutting support for an idea. Embedded here is the idea that the force of one's commitment is the primary measure of an activist, end quote. Cannon has a simple and compelling answer for this dynamic. Quote, ultra-liberalism, like liberalism, is not rooted in materialist, material analysis, but rests on the moral quality of the activist, either through their high degree of consciousness or their high degree of suffering, end quote. Cannon reminds us that as frustrating as these tendencies are, the phenomena should be entreated sympathetically because as pressure mounts in the system and the contradictions heighten, people are repeatedly let down and betrayed by bourgeois liberal politicians and political formations like the Democratic Party, political PACs, or NGOs themselves. People tend to start to move away from middle consensus forms of liberalism that represent the ideology of the ruling class, and they will, quote, reach the edge of political tendencies to which they can put a name and which have some accessible organizational form. Um, like, for example, 
I used to be a centrist, but after the Obama years, I became more liberal. And when Trump got elected, I became much more progressive. Then when Bernie lost to Biden, I went full X, end quote, where X is whatever term they associate with extreme radical politics, end quote. So, Devin, you have some thoughts here. Yeah. Um, you know, this goes back to the importance of education and meeting people where they're at and not where we'd like them to be. Yeah. You know, like I, th- I think Cannon's completely right about, about being sympathetic towards these people because, you know, when dealing with people in real life who are politically confused, you know, we have to meet them with a level of sympathy and understanding because, because no one becomes fully conscious politically overnight. It's a process and it's a process that we've all been through as well, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And, um, you know, it's difficult because some of these tendencies are so toxic and dehumanizing and people really put into question your authenticity and your political personhood when you're just a, when you might just be like a fucking person struggling to make it. And like, can you imagine being a, a position like that downtrodden and then put through some sort of hearsay cancel campaign because you, you, you know, you made a mistake or, or maybe at first you were flippant about something you didn't understand, you know, it's like, you know, yeah. so this is, this is the experience that a lot of people have. And, and this is why they're not attracted to kind of left organizations. And I think right. he's absolutely right. Like in treating people, not only people who are on one side of this with compassion, but also treating people in the working class with compassion who are really, again, in good faith, trying to do the right thing. But yeah, the, you know, I was going to say, this is why it's important that we're doing this podcast is to, is to divorce these elements from the actual left, you know, so that we don't have this toxic environment um, where the left can, can just sort of thrive away from, from all of that nonsense that's just dragging yeah. it down and is just totally counterproductive to the, to the left wing project in general. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, um, divorcing it, it, it's kind of like, uh, it's, it's, it's like an intellectual enterprise, like amongst the advanced layers of the left, I think this analysis needs to be brought. And I think, you know, the kind of intermediate layers of the left also need to wrestle with this. And then I think if people can kind of understand that liberalism is hegemonic but it doesn't really chart a path forward, then I think it's going to be, it's going to be more clear implicitly, like what will chart a path forward. And that's, you know, at the end of the day, it's class conscious working class politics, you know, and what what form, whatever various forms that may take and, you know, whatever organizations that might take that may not exist yet. And even for existing organizations to begin to, you know, and we'll get more into this towards the end of our article. There's some comments I have on th- that kind of begin to chart that out. But yes, nevertheless, Devin, you're right. Um, you know, that's the process we, we have to begin here. So, and I, I just wanted to add one more thing. You know, it takes it takes a level of of courage and daring to be able to 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 just say it how it is, because with this this uh, this dominant tendency of of policing, uh, people are genuinely scared to speak about these ideas you know they they don't want to be canceled like we've like you talked about earlier it's like there's just this general fear amongst people and i think it takes you know uh, as a you know a, a a minority of people to start talking about these issues courageously and openly because the thing is a lot of people you know they don't they know that something is wrong with all of this they know that it's not productive. They 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 intuit that, but you know they don't have the the right, um, you know, they don't possess maybe the education to understand why, but they do know that something deep down is wrong. So it's like I yeah. think once people start talking about it openly, um, it, it'll it'll cause a sort of chain reaction, and people will be more willing to to entertain more practical ideas. Yeah. Yeah, well said. Yeah, it's Absolutely. it's like it's it's like a, we're we've succumbed to a, a new form of an inquisition, and you know the, mm. the ones that are loud and brash are the are the high priests who somehow have the authority to dictate 
Um, in a way, it's like, you know, a, a, an apt word might be demagocracy, right? It's like a, a rule of the, of the loud mouths. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I mean, um, cancel kids and fucking, you know, ultras can be pretty loud. <laughs> And they, they, they got a curious form of confidence to, to be loud in that regard. But, uh, you know, going on back to the summary of, of this section, uh, Cannon astutely, astutely points out in the end of this section that the political education of most Americans is wanting in the extreme when it comes to nuanced political ideology. And getting back to the point of like kind of entreating people who may engage in this kind of ultra liberalism with sympathy and compassion you know, this is this point speaks directly to that, because, again, generally education in the United States tends to leave out things like communism, socialism, Marxism, anarchism, or even hard, hard right political ideologies, for that matter, stating that in the United States, quote, a person leaves the signposted path and enters a wilderness, but the instincts and presumptions of U.S. liberalism tend to remain, end quote. Cannon rightly points out that Americans are nearly congenitally unable to entreat politi to politics with intelligence, nuance, and as such, of course, they wander about in a wilderness, never leaving liberalism. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you know, well said in my thoughts. Yeah, I was I was going to point out that this reminds me of, um, uh, I believe his his name is Richard Wolf. Yeah, the socialist Richard Wolf. He talks a lot about this, about how, like, in, even just in academia, like, yeah, and he went they, to Harvard. Don't, I think he went to Harvard. Like, they don't even teach Marx. You know, like people don't like you're, you're not in a, me in a meaningful way. Like, not in a meaningful way, yeah. right? It's it's you don't you don't get this this uh, like nuanced political education that that takes into account like left wing, you know, socialist Marxists, you know. Um, uh, like critiques of of capitalism and that sort of thing in society, so it's like without that, you know, people are like like Cannon said, it's like they're just they just wander about in a in a wilderness, never leaving liberalism because they don't they just don't know where else to go. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And before you get on to the next part, I mean, that just reminds me of that Jordan Peterson debate with uh, Slavoj Žižek uh, when he was kind of going on there making uh these like really kind of empty remarks about like cultural marxism mm -hmm. and you know the dominance of cultural marxism that was like a perfect example you kind of expect that from people on the right which jordan peterson is definitely on the right um but slavoj zizek was basically able to kind of point out like you know y you're just kind of um you're talking out of your ass here you know <laughs> have these assertions like point to me the the these marxists like you know right. uh demagogues that you're that you're railing about you know where are they you know um and uh it's you know relation of, of, has, of neoliberalism and marxism say that again or it's it's the it's the conflation with uh neoliberalism and postmodernism i should say with with marxism they think that that postmodernism uh, i think so that's the issue i think so. yeah like like the new left like frankfurt school thinkers who who you know read Marx, but were not explicitly Marxist per se, but ha you know took some of his ideas and and used them for their own you know ideological purposes that really aren't Marxist at all, but which he uses as some conspiracy that like Marxists decided to infiltrate and they they decided to 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 tackle the realm of culture to take over you know America from the inside, so to speak, culturally, which is, it's yeah. just nonsense. Right. Exactly. Exactly. But, but that's on the right. Again, we kind of expect that level of kind of confusion and, and even disingenuousness on the right. But again, even on the left, I just don't think people and can, can and rightly points out people are just not educated at the levels necessary to really deal meaningfully with, a lot of these nuances and that's just frankly an issue that's going to need to be turned around in a meaningful way um so that said uh the next section the ultra liberal meritocracy worth and authenticity devin please take it away 
Yeah, so Cannon goes on from here to be uh, outlining and describing the modalities under which a dubious form of merit is ascertained, ascribed, and proffered. Also, the absolutely negative effects of this, quote, ultra-liberal meritocracy on successfully organizing working people. The following section in the article he titles, uh, The Ultra-Liberal Meritocracy, Worth and Authenticity. Cannon illustrates the pervasiveness of a certain dynamic, which is that of individuals constantly, uh, and I quote, questioning the authenticity or relative worth of other people's experience, identity, and motives, unquote. Cannon uh, Cannon asserts that this is an intentional function within ultra-liberalism, that of policing political boundaries, which he says is a vestigial, vestigial tool of NGO political practice often escalating into cycles of bullying, harassment, cancellation, wreckerism, and other forms of destructive organizational conduct uh, following along. Um, Cannon opines a bit on the effective hegemony ultra-liberalism has on the radical American left, stating, uh, and I quote, ultra-liberalism is a predominant strain of the radical left and is found frequently even in nominally socialist organizations. Conflicts within socialist and radical membership organizations are often a function of this, uh, quote unquote, invisible ultra liberalism. Part of the reason it is invisible is because it is attributive. Few people would identify themselves that way, yet they're easy to spot. Ultra liberals have a uh, have an aversion to plans and strategies that require discipline and leadership because they are averse to the liberty and genius of individuals or informal cliques of activists. They are hostile to power in the abstract, for instance, comparing political power within an organization with the authority of the state or employers. They see an organization not not as an inherently hierarchical entity meant to fulfill a specific function, but as a cordoned off space where no power exists and therefore no ideology or strategy is allowed to predominate. A walled off Eden where a million flowers may bloom. This discomfort is the majority rule that could trivialize their expertise, special relationships, or preference of place, and it harmonizes with their intuitive sense that individual mo- uh, individual worth determines one's political agency, unquote. Yeah, I just want to jump in real quick and, and just make a quick comment. Um, I, I love that so much. I think that really hits the nail on the head, and I, this gets into an idea of like, in the DSA, for example, the Democratic Socialists of America considers itself like a big tent organization. But I think there's two different kinds of big tent. There's a positive big tent and then there's a negative big tent. And this and and I think Cannon really starts to get into that distinction. Not like he's not making that distinction. I'm making that distinction here. But I think implicitly is some of the meat behind that distinction, which is that you know, um, a, a majority rule, like a leadership, pr- provides a direction, and that direction might start to de de um, deprioritize certain people's special relationships, preference of place, expertise, or blah blah blah, especially of the NGO variety, and and so it's going to start advancing a discourse and a dialectic that starts seeing like the falling off of certain um, political kind of uh, directions and the prioritization of other directions. And that's just, that's like, that's what happens in a healthy organization that starts to democratically kind of move and dialectically move towards uh, a kind of a higher place, you know, but in a negative big tent, which I'll get to a little bit more later, it's just kind of like, you know, everybody kind of gets to participate and nothing, nothing is challenged or, 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 you know, uh, really addressed meaningfully. Uh, There is no kind of movement in the organization. It's just kind of stagnation. So I'll leave my comments there. Yeah. So continuing on, uh, in describing this further, we'll be reading directly from the article in this section and taking time to respond as this part of the, the article is such an absolute banger. Uh, And I quote, so they seek to monopolize the authority of giving or taking authenticity or moral worth. Uh, 
to shift organizational practice away from democratic decision-making in open forums and towards more, more informal small group interpersonal processes while throttling the ability of formal political leadership to lead. He continues, for ultra liberals, your right to be heard, listened to, or led, in fact, your very worthiness as a political actor in the world, is based on a set of qualifications they create, a version of the general liberal tendency to set the boundaries of political participation and the NGO political logic of policing community authenticity. The important point is that it is not simply assumed, it has to be bestowed. It is not a result of objective social relations, but subjective merit. This is, a, uh, this is certainly effective and may even be beneficial for certain organizational forms, but it is a fatal flaw in any formation aspiring to draw in masses of people and politicize them. For ultra-liberals, uh, ultra it is not a matter of the working class and their objective adversaries. Rather, it is based on a sort of means testing. You see this expressed in a variety of ways. Yeah. One, as discussed in the liberal to ultra left pipeline article, is in their radical aesthetics, radical statements, maximalist positions, intolerance of nuance. This demonstrates a high level of commitment that earns their political rights. Another is through engaging highly symbolic and even dangerous tactics or unqualified support for such tactics. Uh, in past eras, this was a kind of propaganda of the deed. Personal danger, violence, and vandalism are lionized not for their strategic function so much as because they indicate a strong moral character. It demonstrates that the person has earned their political being. Political personhood or agency can also be bestowed through various aspects of a person's identity whether that is fabricated working class identity of the straight talking blue collar worker or only the poorest or based on a person's place or residence, their ethnic or racial identity or any other element of a person's identity. But, and this is the essential defect of this ideology, this always comes with a sinister asterisk because the nature of contingent political personhood means some individuals can always decide on the authenticity of any other person and therefore their political agency. Yet, so-and-so might appear to belong to this or that demographic group, etc., but they do not qualify as true. They are not really to be listened to because, 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 and here they will always find some denominator meant to dilute their authenticity. Continuing on reading from Cannon's article, they will always find a way to cut a person's legitimacy because of the contradiction they create. If one's political agency comes from some list of qualification, a person who's who meets those qualifications but dis disagrees with them becomes the most dangerous threat to their soft power and so cannot be tolerated as and has to be undermined. Continuing on. Ultra-liberals can always find some reason to disqualify somebody else but excuse themselves. The internal contradiction here is that ultra-liberals will often be the loudest voices insisting on focusing on or centering some segment of the working class, while at the same time re reserving the right to qualify or define political agency. They have to jealously guard their exclusive right to bestow political agency, to rate it authentically, uh, to rate authenticity, it cannot be allowed to slip from their grasp for even a moment because absent this power, their politics reduces to liberal moralizing and intransigent opposition to big picture organizational programs. This is the cause of the startling but common phenomena of ultra liberals freely, even cruelly willing to attack undermine and question the legitimate legitimacy of people's identity. In other words, they seek to enforce their own domination by stripping people of their agency, disqualifying them from the exact same centering they insist on by generating arbitrary rules for political authenticity. The ultra liberal tendency defines who is valid, who is a valid political actor and who is not and they will try to dictate who can genuinely speak from their experience of workplace, racial, gender, or any form of social oppression. 
In this way, the ultra-liberal tendency recreates a pernicious form of interpersonal oppression, white supremacy, and bigotry. This political practice of policing the boundaries rests on this liberal notion of political personhood and uses the discursive tool of policing community belonging rooted in the nonprofit industry. Within political organizations, it justifies the preeminence of particular leaders and activist layers by drawing boundaries around who is an authentic actor and who is not. The ultra-liberal political practice in membership organizations of the left is destructive. It depoliticizes memberships and demoralizes them, finds excuses to exclude members from political participation, and actively discourages organizational work meant to make the bulk of membership feel empowered. It also encourages ostensible comrades to put one another under the microscope, dig into their backgrounds, sift through personal histories, where they were born, when they moved to this place and to that, who they date or married, and perhaps most astoundingly, to sit in judgment of the authenticity of one another's racial and ethnic authenticity. Anything they can use to chip away at the agency, even humanity of their political rivals at the moment. With these terms of the debate, it creates a hopeless race to the bottom, where members are terrified of having their own authenticity questioned and so feel compelled to demonstrate their political value through reckless acts, cruel attacks, or obedient loyalty to the most effective bullies. It plays on psychic guilt about their own background, their degree of personal connection to their background, moving them to prove themselves in ever more spectacular feats of projection and deflection to keep the bully's eye from landing on them. This is very similar to the atmosphere created at NGOs, where staff are trained to view themselves as essentially different from constituencies, as both their self-sacrificing saviors and less authentic and as less authentic outsiders. It is a needless dynamic that ultra-liberals stoke instinctively in a demoralizing and internally destructive pattern that is ultimately based on pointless political principle, end quote. And um, yeah, there's really a lot to be said there. I think, Phoenix, you had some thoughts. Yeah. Uh, this is part of the performative uh, superficial uh, w- way that the left has gone wrong. Uh, you mentioned propaganda of the deed, for example. Um, you know, what, what it comes down to at the end of the day is that it's important uh, that we focus on collective action and actual mobilization and organization to create real social change. Um, but propaganda of the deed, uh, it relies on isolated individual acts that may not actually engage and empower the broader working class and society as a whole. Um, What really actually changes society are the structural and organizational conditions relating to culture, power, uh, mechanisms of the state, uh, education, economy. These are the actual real conditions of society as it is in the real world. Now, propaganda of the deed fails to address the structural and systemic issues that perpetuate both the material and psychological oppression uh, that uh, faces society. True revolution focuses on comprehensive systemic change rather than just superficial acts and signals. Uh, You know, so propaganda of the deed, it feels good for instinctive anti-authoritarians who are viscerally reacting against oppression. Uh, but in the real world, the revolution uh, doesn't support it because of its emphasis on individual acts over collective action and of its failure to address the underlying structural issues that led to those problems in the first place. So the actual ultimate things that we need to focus on for, for societal transformations are the structural and cultural machinations of that society. It's about changing the culture. It's about transforming policy. It's about transforming the, uh, the legal system transforming education, transforming economic policy, um, and therefore preoccupying ourselves with organizing around accomplishing those, those practical and tangible ends. So it's, it's emphatically not about individual acts that amount to no more than a tantrum or a virtue signal. 
Um, and that itself is ironically just another form of liberalism. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going back to what uh, Cannon said. He said, you know, it creates a hopeless race to the bottom where members are terrified of having their own authenticity questioned and so feel compelled to demonstrate their political value through reckless acts, cruel attacks, or obedient loyalty to the most effective bullies. Um, and he goes on to say, you know, going back, that it plays on psychic guilt about their own background and so on and so forth. And it reminds me of this time where I was hanging out with a buddy and uh, we go outside, we're just sit, sitting outside around a fire and uh, his roommate comes out and like he's distressed because he just broke up with a girlfriend of his. And he starts to like, you know, just we just start talking about his experience. And he said he starts with he's like, yeah, man, this woman's a bitch. And then as soon as he said that, he was like, he had to qualify himself. He's like, well, you know, I, I understand that that bitch is probably not the, the right word to use. And then we started, you know, the other roommates started chiming in about like whether or not bitch was the, the politically correct term and if it was like misogynistic. And it was just like, can we just can we just have a normal conversation here? You know, like I, I remember asking, him, I was like, wait, 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 hold up. Is was she being a bitch? And he's like, yeah. It's like, okay, well, let's move on. She was being a bitch. <laughs> it reminds me, it's almost like, it's like the, the store of the emperor has no clothes. It's like everybody knows the emperor is naked, right? Yeah. Like I, th- I, I, I would tend to feel that most people, unless they're insane, probably have a sense of, well, I feel this is kind of bullshit, but I know it's what I got to do. So we're all just kind of like playing this this game of, of uh, you know, acquiescing to, to the Inquisition, as opposed to you know saying that the emperor has no clothes and calling out the bullshit, in which case they'll call you a right wing reactionary. So you really can't win. Yeah. yeah, and you know it just it destroys like genuine dialogue between people because like here it was I was just you know we were just connecting as people talking about a, a breakup. We've all been through breakups, and like here here this this like just just this genuine dialogue is being broken up by by all this like you know, like walking on eggshells and shit, walking on eggshells. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just so, it's just so ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in the final section, um, of this article, uh, Canon has a small section called the function of ideological pluralism. And this is a really good section with like, it's short, And, and, you know, some really excellent points are made. So let's just get into it. So in the final section of part five of Cannon's article titled titled, The Function of Ideological Pluralism, Cannon concludes by pointing to an interesting irony in ultra-liberalism, which is that ultra-liberals express a sincere devotion to ideological diversity, but one which serves a very negative function. The ideological pluralism of ultra liberals is akin to a big tent relativism. In other words, it is decidedly non dialectical. Hence, it is antithetical to the development of members of an organization in any particularly healthy direction, let alone one that is mass action oriented. Um, So, just to jump in here, I like, uh, you know, Cannon argues that. that ultra liberals are all about ideological purity as a, as a good in and of itself. And, you know, again, we go back to this, this like sociological orientation of other directedness, like this postmodern, even, you know, new age consciousness raising liberal notion of all paths and all truths, the, 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 the demonization of, of yeah. making judgments around a singular truth and like this promotion of unlimited acceptance, which, which, uh, of course, introduces sectarianism, you know, therefore, therefore undermining any effort to create a unified, united class conscious left. Um, whereas Marxists use ideological pluralism dialectically to pursue, to pursue a specific organizational goal, while ultra liberals use it as an end in and of itself, you know, or, or, or as like a safe space to be free from dogma and authority. Yeah. Um, Well, continuing on, um, Cannon states astutely, 
quote, ultra liberals expressed a sincere devotion to ideological diversity, but there is more than meets the eye. For Marxists, a political culture of ideological debate serves a dialectical purpose. It is functional. It is not because ideological pluralism is a good in and of itself. That is to say, the value of open debate is that it forces analysis to advance through a dialectical clash. It improves results. So debate, in other words, should have a result, an outcome that establishes a definitive organizational direction. Ultra-liberals, on the other hand, are more interested in ensuring that there is no definitive result, that ideological pluralism is maintained no matter what, and that an organization serves merely as an open space. In this way, formal power of democratic decision-making cannot overcome the soft power of setting political boundaries. Open debate without resolution can also lead to that debate being abstract, unattached <clears throat> from practical organizational tasks. And when debate d- becomes abstract, it becomes much more vicious. Um, and, you know, uh, there's more of the article uh, that I want to directly quote from in-, in concluding. But I just wanted to get back to this big tent comment that I made earlier and talk about two ways of looking at the big tent. And I think that preface that I just started reading from directly quoting the article really begins to, uh, uh, there's a, you know, to to delineate those two ways of looking at the big tent. So the DSA, for example, the democratic socialists of America are a big tent organization. And frankly, it's a good thing because it needs to be a big tent organization because if a, 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 a political organization, whether it's the DSA or any sort of large left organization, wants to actually transmute its raw materials, like all the people who participate, and start to develop them and make them uh, become uh, higher degrees of consciousness, uh, engage in higher degrees of like political consciousness, then it needs to ultimately have a, a element where it's welcoming and open to people of different tendencies, provided that they have some commitment to the broad goals of that organization. And in that sense, that's a positive version of a big tent, right? Again, that's presuming that this organization is allowed to debate dialectically and to move democratically in a direction that is definitive, you know, through that debate through the process of engaging and communicating and settling, you know, questions, right? In a meaningful way and in, in a, with, a, with a, enough time as to have a full discussion. The other hand, there's a negative form of big tent, which is just ideological pluralism for the sake of ideological pr- pluralism. Unattached from practical organization t- t- uh, tasks And that pluralism, that kind of big tent where there's a space for everybody, you know, no matter what and constantly that that actually it does. Things become very abstract. It's like, you know, like if, for example, if you have an organization that has people who like maybe they joined, but they're fundamentally antithetical, like they're opposed to the ostensible goals of let's let's look at the DSA an example democratic socialists of america you would assume that everybody who participates in this organization is positive on yeah. on getting you know american politics uh towards a state of democratic socialism well you you know you might not be shocked to find out that some people really don't care for that goal at all and then you'd have to ask yourself well why the fuck are they around <laughs> you know because well if a, if the DSA has a commitment to big tent no matter what even through contradiction and ideological pluralism that just contradicts those those basic goals is that really healthy the the question becomes is that healthy and i think the answer is clearly no you know Mm -hmm. so um so that's my little aside and I'll, i'll go ahead and conclude by reading the the final paragraph here from canon's article quote 
This is another reason why ultra liberals so readily resort to interpersonal attacks of stripping others of their political personhood. Because while they need ideological pluralism in, av- in order to avoid any degree of discipline, they also want to be able to smother ascendant ideological tendencies at any given moment. Thus, the promiscuity in ultra liberals' political allies. Last month, anarchists this month, revolutionary sectarians, and next month, generically anti-capitalist community organizers or elected officials. Whatever alliance has the most use in preventing the emergence of any predominant tendency, minority tendencies naturally are drawn to these alliances, unaware or self-denying that they will never last long enough to develop into a majority ideological view. And that last paragraph, also extremely prescient and extremely apt. We've seen this in Portland in the DSA. You have certain maximalist kind of like formations and caucuses allying with, um, you know, seemingly contradictory political allies. But it's just like whatever works to maintain hegemony and to be able to use like a, a kind of clout cudgel to, to smother their em- enemies and any ascendant kind of opposition from rising. It's, it's totally valid. It's exactly what happens. Gentlemen, any other kind of final thoughts to round us out before we close out the episode? Well, I'd like to just, uh, yeah, I'd like to just add just kind of a 30,000 foot view of why we're talking about what we're talking about and what our purpose is here. Uh, you know, we want to see a trend, a transformative shift in society. Uh, we want, we want to spread ideas to uh, in, inform and inspire the masses towards a, a much new, more glorious vision for humanity. And uh, that has typically been the realm of the left, which is progressive and forward thinking and unifying. And the left itself has been uh, overtaken by these ideas that we are now critiquing, which is a, has a major stipend on effect on that, uh, on that progress that we seek to achieve. Um, yeah. So for those listeners, you know, we just want to reiterate, we are critiquing uh, what we believe is the rot in something that is inherently noble so that we can cut the fat out, you know, cut out that rot and uh, and bring it back to that noble and, and glorious, uh, you know, manifestation that, you know, we seek to, to, <laughs> to achieve. Yeah, uh, in, well in a sense, in a sense, cut out the rot. I don't know if I'm... Uh, you know, if I'm I'm eager to put on the surgeon's cape, but certainly we need to disaggregate this kind of um, this kind of like liberal leftism from actual leftism, and we, you know, in doing that again, as we've said throughout the episode, people are going to be in a position to really know what real solidarity looks like, and to really know what focusing on practical, tangible goals looks like and to really understand what mass action as a political practice looks like. And uh, with that said, we are going to be signing off. This has been the wasteland and the mountain. Thank you for tuning in to our sixth episode. Please subscribe and join for future episodes. We'll be diving deep into the concepts, ideas, and great intellects and thinkers of the class conscious left. And by the way, the next episode, episode seven, we're going to be concluding Rams and Cannon's article, the final two sections of Cannon's article, which is part six and seven. Uh, and we'll be doing that next week. Thank you, everybody. And good night.